Well, hello, Chapmanville Community Church family. This is Pastor Glenn, and it is great to be able to join with you for another midweek prayer meeting, prayer time, and Bible study as we join together and study uh, to study God's Word. It is um, a beautiful day here in Pennsylvania today, and uh, earlier yesterday we had snow. Uh, I'm looking out the window right now at my home study, and uh, the grass is green and the flowers are still pretty, um, but uh, uh, the snow really took its toll on them the last couple of days off and on. It's been some crazy weather, but we're thankful that God is, uh, God is still God and He is still on the throne. Uh, a passage of scripture I wanted to just share with you, um, just that I was reading over uh, earlier today, and uh, um, actually read it today and was thinking about it the last couple days, but uh, the passage is found in Luke chapter 18. I'm not going to put it up. I just want to read a little bit of this to you, and, and uh, you'll know the story, but I want this to kind of settle in our hearts and minds as we get into this study today. Um, in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 9, Jesus spoke uh, a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And then Jesus tells this, this parable of two men who went up to the temple to pray. Um, uh, one of them was a Pharisee and the other one was a tax collector. Uh, the Pharisee, uh, verse 11 says that the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even, even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the tax, uh, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And um, Jesus said, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, uh, rather than the other man, went to his house justified, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And so as we just kind of ponder over and allow God, and allow the Holy Spirit to um, impress that passage on our hearts, um, how is it that we're going before the Lord in prayer? Are we going with prideful, arrogant hearts? Well, I'm better than most people are. Or are we going with a humble heart and a humble spirit? As we come together for this time, just to, uh, taking a few moments today at this time together to be able to pray. I'm going to pray and kind of lead us in some prayer today and uh, ask that you would join with me at home or wherever you're at and be able to pray as well. Bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, um, I thank you that you have been merciful to me. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your son, Jesus, without whom I wouldn't stand a chance and be able to even be or do anything in life of, that would count, and certainly nothing for you. Everything I am is because of Jesus, and I thank you for him. We pray, Father, for our, for our world today. There are so many things that are just in disarray and so many things that are in turmoil. We pray, pray, Father, for, for our states, our regions, wherever we live, our nations, wherever we happen to be living, that each individual that calls upon your name as Lord and Savior, Father, that they would bow their hearts before you and that we would cry out to you and we would, we would come to you on bended knee and that we would pray as this man prayed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I thank you that you have forgiven us of our sins if we've accepted you. But Father, your word also tells us if we regard iniquity in our heart, that you will not hear us. I'm thankful, Father, for um, 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So God, today I pray for your forgiveness for me individually, for us corporately, and for us as a nation and as a people. 
that we will turn our hearts back to you, and that in doing so, Father, that you would bring about a revival in our hearts that would ripple across our our families, our churches, our communities, our regions, our nations, and our world in a manner that would bring great honor and glory to you. Father, I pray for those who are not able to be with their families today for whatever reason, whether they are just removed and living somewhere different. Sometimes that being distant is difficult. We pray, God, that you would touch those hearts and lives and minister to them. We pray, Father, for our church family, and I I pray, Father, for those that have gone through difficulties even in this last week, that we know the names, we know the faces, and we may not know the entire situation, but we know enough, Lord, to bring them before you and ask that you would work and minister to them. So, Father, we ask that you would love on them and you'd bring about healing to them. For each of us, Father, draw us back to you. We also pray, God, for those that are our friends, our loved ones, maybe our family members that do not know you as Savior and Lord. God, I pray that they would accept your son Jesus for the full covering, the full payment of their sins, and that in receiving him, that they would turn their lives around through the indwelling and the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would see great revival and great change take place in hearts and lives marriages restored, lives restored and put back on track, following after you in all that we do. We pray, Father, for our first responders, our police officers, our our firemen, our ambulance workers, our doctors, our nurses. We pray for our leaders, God, who are trying to make decisions about something that they cannot understand and they're trying to figure it out from their own perspective. I pray, God, that they would seek you and that from a position of trusting you and being led by you that they would make wise and right decisions that would best honor you. I pray today, Father, that as we study your word, that you would be our teacher, that your spirit would speak to our hearts, and that all that we say and all that we do would honor you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, as we start into this today, we finished chapter 8 last week, and we should be in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 today. So hopefully you have your Bibles with you and maybe even already have them opened up to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to start out here with a a couple questions uh, to throw at you and just to uh, put in your minds as we're thinking through things. Here's the first question. What is the right way to give to a need. This is actually pretty appropriate for this time when we have quite a few things that are going on in the world around us um, uh, with uh, the COVID virus and and many needs. What What is the right way? What is the right way to be able to give to a need? I realize that even if we have bad motives and and bad perspective of how we're doing it, Uh, If we give, the need is met, but really and truly, how is it that we should give? Here's a second question um, What is to this, the alternative, what is the right way to give to a need? What is the wrong way to give to a need? How, how, How could we give to a need that would be a wrong way, a wrong motive, a wrong purpose, um, uh, a wrong desire? What is the wrong way to give to a need? Well, as we look at this passage of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is continuing to teach um, the people at Corinth about uh, giving. And um, let's look at verse 1 and we'll start right in with this. He says, Now concerning the ministering to the saints, It is superfluous for me to write to you. Paul is continuing to to speak about the financial collection that is being taken for the Christians who are in great need in Jerusalem. We've talked about that before, so we won't go into that again. Uh, But the word that's used here that I have underlined, now concerning the ministering, uh, it's the word where we get the word deacon or diaconate, um, diakonia. I believe is is how I would say it. It means ministering. And here's something interesting. It means waiting on tables. And in the wider sense, one writer says serving, serving others. I I think that oftentimes, um, and I actually, uh, I heard this 
uh, several years ago, someone who was on a leadership board at a church um, said that they were really excited to be able to be on the deacon board because they had so much power and could make so many decisions and change. Friends, that's not what it's supposed to be. The, the word actually means one who ministers, one who serves others. And so this collection that is related to the Jerusalem um, uh, needs actually is part of Paul's commission. Um, that when Paul had been affirmed um, as in his calling as an apostle to the Gentiles, he was asked, he was asked to continue to remember the poor. And let, let, let's look at that. In Galatians chapter 2, in fact, in Galatians chapter 2, verses 9 through 9 and 10, it says, And when James and Cephas, or Peter, when James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, Paul is writing this, says, They gave me the right hand of fellowship, gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So they were going to go to the Jews, and, and Paul and Barnabas were going to go to the Gentiles. Verse 10, look at this. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So what Paul was doing was in this collection was he was actually following through on, on the commission that he'd been given. He was going to go to the Gentiles, but in doing so, he was not to forget the poor. And so as Paul is continuing to fulfill his calling, what his, this project that he is doing actually is furthering the call that had been placed on him when the leaders in Jerusalem had sent him out to minister uh, to the Gentiles. Look at continuing on in verse, in verse 1. Now concerning the ministering to the saints... Considering cons concerning the ministering to the saints, I think it's important. Again, I love to be able to break these words down and these sentences down to kind of remind ourselves who they're talking about. The ministering that is going on here is to the saints or to those people who have been set apart either by God or set apart for God's use and His purpose. Uh, Strong's Concordance says that this word could be translated as and I quote, an awful thing, or, ah, oh, saints, sacred, being physically pure, or morally blameless, or being religious, a most holy thing. Thayer says that the term is rare in secular writing, but very frequent in sacred writing. And so Paul is saying and reminding them that he is, that, that, what they are doing is ministering to these people who are saints. They are holy. They are not that they are perfect, but they are they are set apart by God, called by God or for God's purpose, who who are experiencing difficulties financially. So they're not just ministering to everybody and anybody. They're really they're minister ministering specifically to those who are believers. He says here as he continues. Um, now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. It's a, the word is over and above or excessive. It's it's um, exceeding, exceedingly. Um, it's it's overflowing. It's it's unnecessary. It's we're going above and beyond. The NIV says there is no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people. Again, a little clarification on some of those words, but, but the NIV says, there is no need for me to write to you about this. That's the idea of superfluous. Um, Adam Clark commentary says, I need not enlarge having already said enough. And, and you go back and look at the preceding chapter. Go see, the, go see chapter 8. He's already talked about this to them in the previous chapter. I, I likened it this way as I was going through my my commentary on this is I don't want to beat a dead horse. Uh, but And you know what? I probably don't even need to bring it up at all. I, I don't want to keep rehashing this, and I probably don't have to say this to you yet again or to go on with this. In fact, Paul uses this phrase other times in in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. 
Paul said this, and you can read along with me as I read aloud. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. So he's saying, in, in essence, it's superfluous for me or for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. So he says, you're already doing this. We, you're doing what we have asked you to do. But he, but he goes on and says, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But even in that, he continues, but we urge you brothers to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Paul um, is writing and remember, and I say this often, but, but it's worth repeating. Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What he is saying needs to be said. So even though he would articulate and say, it's superfluous for me to say this, I don't even need to say this. The fact that he says it may not be his, his need to say it, but the Holy Spirit is continuing to, to inspire him to write these words to the people at Corinth and really to each one of, uh, each one of us who have been able to read it. Look at verse 2. So while it may be superfluous for me to write to you, verse 2, For I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia, and I'll get that right in a little bit probably, was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Let's break this down and look at this uh, just for a little bit here. For I know your willingness. I know your eagerness or your zeal. I know your enthusiasm. I know your readiness. I know your promptness, uh, as one writer says. I know your readiness of mind. Uh, one writer said, one, one um, uh, commentary said, before passion is how this could be translated. I know your, your before passion desire, before you were stirred up emotionally, referring to someone who is already willing, already eager, and pre, pre-inclined to do this. They, they were stirred in their heart. They were very willing to be able to do this. And look what he says here, your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, about which I boast to you to the Macedonians. I'm going to um, look at this just a second here. He says, that willingness is that of which Paul had boasted of the Corinthians to the Macedonians. He had talked to the Macedonians and he'd been bragging about what the Corinthians were going to do. Notice what Paul said uh, to the Macedonians here. Uh, notice what he said. He bragged or he boasted about the Corinthians to the Macedonians. He bragged about them. He's, he's really talking them up. Uh, someone once said this. They said, you want to praise publicly but you want to correct privately. You want, I'm going to say that again. You want to praise publicly and you want to correct privately. Paul is speaking to, uh, writing to the Corinthians and, and in so he's correcting them and just encouraging them to make good on what they had, had offered and promised to do. But when Paul had spoken to the Macedonians, Boy, he lifted, he made much of what the Corinthians had promised to do. And so he's, he's saying, listen, I, I, I've already boasted about you to the Macedonians. Now, as we look at this, I'll bring a map up here. And you can see this map is, is of, uh, of the area of Greece. Uh, Macedonia is in the yellow up there, and it is the northern, in the northern region of, of Greece. Um, Achaia. Achaia is how it's pronounced, is the region in the south. And so if you looked at this area of Greece and, and um, uh, Macedonia was the top region and Achaia was the southern reg region um, of the Peloponnesian Peninsula in, in classical Greek. Achaia was a Roman province 
that included most of the southern and the central area of Greece, and you can see that, but here's the important thing. Its capital was Corinth. And so as Paul is writing here, and as we kind of put this all into perspective, look to see what it was that Paul was saying to the Macedonians about the Corinthians. He says, for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Achaia, this region, this southern region, I'll back up there, this southern region was not just the Corinthian church, I believe. I, I believe it was churches throughout that region, maybe, maybe church plants of which Corinth had planted little house churches, and so it covered a bigger area throughout that, air, that, that region. And so he's saying here that Achaia was ready a year ago. The region was ready a year ago to be able to give, and, and your zeal, Corinthian zeal, the, the zeal of the Corinthian believers has stirred up the majority. This, this church in Corinth stirred the hearts of many to be able to, to give so that Paul was telling the Macedonians that, that the church at Corinth and the church in Achaia was they were eager to give and he was he was actually he was building everyone up. See he was he was always talking good to others about other churches. He wasn't airing their laundry. If he had something he had to say, he talked to the Corinthians directly. If he needed to talk to the Galatians, he wrote to them directly. We have the benefit of that, but he's not writing to one church, bad-mouthing another. And what does he say? He says that your zeal, he says your zeal has stirred up the majority, or the zeal of the Corinthians has stirred up the majority. The ESV says that your zeal has stirred up most of them, or the New Living Translation says that it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. Evidently, Paul had written earlier, when he had written earlier in 1 Corinthians, we read it in chapter 16, what he had sent to them was met with great enthusiasm by the Corinthian believers, and that when he learned of their enthusiasm, he bragged of their enthusiasm, he bragged of their zeal when he spoke to, when he had interaction with people from the Macedonian churches so that they were hearing, everybody was being encouraged by what was going on. This had been, become a factor in the generous offering um, uh, for the Jerusalem Christians that Paul had already begun to gather up, that the Macedonians had been gathering was that they were hearing about the generosity of the Corinthians and it was encouraging others to be able to give as well. It, it kind of reminds me of, of the time that we're in. Kind of reminds me of the time that we're in. Imagine for a second um, that somebody with this COVID-19, some, some uh, uh, corporation or some church or some region or some rich person pledged to get heard of all that was going on and said, you know what? I'm going to give. I, I want to give and I want to help out in this situation. And so they give in a way that really and truly is generous above and beyond. They, they make that promise. Well, all of a sudden I hear that this corporation or this celebrity or, or this rich person is going to give a whole bunch of money. Maybe they even have a live YouTube um, a fundraiser going on or they do something live on Facebook or on television and they have call-in things and they say I'm gonna match dollar for dollar I'm gonna give a lot of money and all of a sudden other people start calling in and calling in but then when it comes time for the original person to make good on what they promised to give they they're a little bit slow on the uptake they're a little slow on following through and so Paul Paul doesn't chastise them, but in this case here, Paul comes along and his intent was to help the Corinthians make good on their promise. His goal was to come alongside of them and to help them to save face, but also to follow through both for their benefit and the benefit of everyone else that had been, had been um, gathering the money together and putting the collection together. Paul comes alongside of them to help them finish their commitment. 
I, I believe that it is a great gift that people have, those who are encouragers, to come alongside of others and encourage them to actually make good on things that they've been doing. Encourage them to see a project through. The writer of Hebrews chapter 10 says something that I think is very, very um, applicable to this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, I'll read from the NIV. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. As you see the day approaching, listen, I'll back up to that. He's saying, listen, spur one another on, encourage one another. And this is a chance of Paul to come alongside these believers and spur them on, encourage them to continue on and continue the good fight. Where are you in your walk right now? Is there something you've left undone? We talked about this maybe last week or a couple weeks ago, but I think it bears repeating. Paul is coming alongside, putting his arm around them and encouraging them to see this through. Maybe you need to be encouraged along. Can I just encourage you today? Spur you along, encourage you lovingly, finish that good work that you've committed to or that you, that you have started that maybe you haven't finished but maybe you see somebody else who has a work that they haven't finished. Maybe you can come alongside of them and love on them and be able to encourage them. Again, lovingly, kindly, coming along, loving them carefully, being that word of encouragement to help them see the project through to completion. Look at verse 3 as we, as we begin to wrap up things here. He says, Yet I have sent the brothers lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that I, that, excuse me, that as I said, you may be ready. He's saying, listen, I, I want to make sure that you are, are ready. I want to make sure that you've got everything together. And that's why I'm sending these others. Look at verse 4. He says, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we not to mention you, should find, excuse me, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. I'm going to back up and read these two verses together because I kind of bumbled them a little bit. I apologize for that. He says, Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Paul was explaining why he was sending this delegation of brothers, Titus and the other two that he was sending that we talked about in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 18 through 24. Their purpose, they were going to aid the Corinthians in arranging the details of the collection. But Paul's purpose was to protect the reputation of the Corinthians in the eyes of the Macedonians. And I believe also, if we see this here, to protect Paul from being ashamed that what he said was not actually true. Everyone wants whatever they say to be true, and Paul is trying to protect his words both to the Macedonians but to others that may, that may hear of it. Look at verse 5. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and to prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Paul is explaining to them and saying he's not simply coming alongside of them to help them prepare so that it's ready, but he wants to make sure that, that how they're going to give is not in a, in a grudging manner, not in a spiteful manner. Um, William Barclay says that there are at least four different ways that we can give. And I thought this was insightful enough, and this is directly from his commentary. Look at these. There's four different ways that Barclay, uh, Barclay points out that we can give, that the gifts can be given. One of the ways that we can give is out of duty. 
We may give, but we do it like we're paying a bill or like we're um, settling up with the tax collector. We're just doing it because we have to and we might not necessarily like the way or like that we have to do it. That's one way we can give. Barclay continues and says, another way that we can give is out of self-satisfaction. That we give, but we give because it just makes us so warm and fuzzy inside to be able to give it all. That we know in our heart that we help somebody out. And that just makes me feel good. That's that's a way that maybe, maybe we can give. Or here's another option that we can also give for prestige. Barclay, Barclay says, and I, I have it written up here, that really and truly the real source of this is not love, but pride. The real reason we're giving is because of the arrogance of, our, of ourselves. Um, the gift is given to help. Um, maybe it's given and it helps, but it's given more to glorify us. We give because we know that if we give, well, they'll put a plaque up or they'll name a building after us. Or if we give just a little bit more, we'll become the gold level, level donor or whatever it happens to be. Paul's saying, um, you know, in this as he's talking, he's making sure that they're not giving as a grudging obligation. But then Barclay says, really and truly, the best example and why we should give is compelled by love. Our giving is not just a matter of giving, but we can't stand the idea of seeing somebody who is in need. We can't stand the thought of seeing somebody who is struggling and our heart is stirred because of our love for God and our love for others, and we just want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I wonder if this is similar to what we see when we look at Romans chapter 5. Verses, verse 8, when we think of God's love, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I believe that God was compelled by love for us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He demonstrated his own love toward us. He put his love into motion. And I think what Paul is saying to the Corinthians is, listen, I want you to give, but I want you to be ready. And I want you to do it with the enthusiasm you started with, not in a grudging manner. And to help you with that, I'm going to come alongside of you today. Well, I don't know how it is that we could come alongside of you, but in this time, we are trying to minister to you any way that we can. We're honored that you would take time to spend with us studying God's Word today. Again, this is Pastor Glenn from Chapmanville Community Church. I am just absolutely honored that you would come here today, that you would be with us today and study God's Word. I hope you'll join us again next time as we study 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Be with us on Sunday as we continue to study God's Word then. We look forward to worshiping with you real soon.